the gods, part two, B, two, the calendar of the gods. We shall begin by looking at the Shimham Farash, that is, the 72 letter long name of God. Just as there are the 99 names of Allah in Islam, there are 12 names of God in Hakabalah though there are more titles than official names. The words officially meaning name of God in Hebrew, Baal Shem, themselves have become a title. The twelve Baal Shema of the gods studied in Hakabalah are the monogrammata, alpha and omega or tau, the digrammata, yadhe, equals ja, al, equals Allah, etc. The trigrammata, I am, equals yadhe va, father, equals aba. The tetragrammata, yadhe vadhe, Elohim, Adonai, etc. The octogrammaton, A H D V N H A Y. The decagrammaton, K T H R Ch K M B N H. The dodecagrammaton, a tripled tetragrammaton. The fourteen letter name, Adonai, Elohino, Adonai. The twenty two letter name, Avraham, Yitchak, Yaakov, Yeshurun. The thirty three letter name, Adonai, El, Eloha, Elohim. Shaddai, Seveot, Ehei, Yah, Yadhevadhe. The 42 letter name, the Notericon of the Anabekeoch prayer, and the 72 or 216 letter name, the Shimham Farash. The Shimham Farash which we see in this 17th century printing by Athanasius Kircher, is either 72 or 216 letters long because it consists of 72 names of angels whose names are three letters long each. As we will come to see in a moment by studying the history of Shemham Farash, these 72 three-letter-long named angels accomplished many miracles, but most importantly, we will come to understand how the original Shemham Farash acted as a symbolic calendar. By studying the history of this name of God, or Baal Shem, we will uncover the nature of this calendar's origins and learn the mechanisms of its use. This calendar, although originating in the era before the Flood, was not considered a calendar of any gods then. It was the first form of attempt at the sort of calendars we use today, made by our earliest cave-dwelling hominid ancestors. It is thus important to remember that this calendar was originally invented by a cave person, one of our earliest Homo sapien ancestors, and is thus one of the most simple and primitive forms of calendar system we could imagine by now. However, it has, since its invention, been fictionally mythologized to such an extent that now it is considered a name of God and not a form of calendar. This occultation of right understanding of this system has been accomplished across the span of many eons by occult cults. Many of these cults have included members who have studied Kabbalah 
However, the geopolitical deeds accomplished by other members of these same cults cannot be blamed on those members who studied Kabbalah while the others sought to rule the world. Suffice it to say, however, that by the time this ancient calendar was being studied by persecuted Kabbalists during the Inquisition era of the Dark Ages in Europe, in Tibet, this elaborate Tonka painting was created to express the six lokas, or worlds, into which a dead soul may reincarnate. We see the engine of this wheel of six lokas, a system the Buddhists call samsara, meaning suffering, is comprised of the three base passions, the boar, passive complacency, equivalent to alchemical salt, the snake, slippery deceptiveness, equivalent to alchemical mercury, and the rooster, active annoyance, equivalent to alchemical sulfur. Around this engine of the wheel of six lokas, or of samsara, we see the philosopher sages ascending clockwise on the left and the tortured fools falling clockwise on the right. Beyond this are the six lokas, or realms inhabited by the different types of bodies into which we can choose to reincarnate. Like a roulette wheel is by luck, the spinning of the wheel of samsara stops for us on the world chosen for us by our karma, meaning labor, as in works or deeds. The six loka worlds of suffering are the animal, the philosopher, the sage, the fool, the lost soul, and the devil. The Buddha sees this all from above, including his own reflection in it, alike a pond of water, and as his reflection ripples in the waves of all living karma, it assumes the visage of Vajra, the wrathful male Kali. Although it depicts the six lokas of samsara, this image should not be thought of in the same sense as the Western business calendar. The calendars employed in the Western business world are used to measure time on a day-to-day -day basis for scheduling when events will occur and for remembering when to change the clocks and when to celebrate what holidays. This system is entirely different from the one being shown us here in this Tibetan Tonka, and yet, because this Tonka is showing us effectively a mirror of all existence, it must also be able to be thought of as simulating a form of calendar. In so far as it indicates the influence of karma as change to one's environment, brought about by one's own will, also the Western definition of magic, the six loka wheel of samsara does at least obliquely imply the presence in the model of the measurement of entropic change as time. Once we begin to see, through the looking glass, of our own ego's interpretation of this model, and to begin to see it as a calendar also, we will notice its six lokas divide a circle of 360 degrees into six even angles of 60 degrees each. The significance of this, that it divides a circle into six equilangular triangles of 60 degrees, will become clear once we begin to pursue the origins of the calendar of 360 days. Here we see the calendar as it was conceived of originally, by our most ancient Homo sapien ancestors, who dwelt in caves near Neanderthals and came to cross-culturally exchange customs with them. The Neanderthals apparently learned to bury their dead from early Homo sapiens. According to the legends from the beginnings of all the greatest empires of civilization in our current era of historical records, their ancestors before the deluge had met alien gods 
who had given early primitive mankind all the rudimentary implements of civilization, from making beads to smelting metal, from planting seeds to beating swords into plowshares. This calendar, the first of any kind of such, is attributed by myths at least as old as the times of King Solomon to the Genesis patriarch Enoch. Enoch was a descendant of Seth and Cain, who was taken off in a dream by an angelic guide and shown a prophetic vision. One aspect of Enoch's dream was a detailed description of a calendar with 364 days. This differs from the calendar we know to be accurate today, that of 365 and one-fourth day long years. However, the calendar of Enoch was strictly specific in detailing this calendar of 364 days as being the original basis for the modern calendar of 365 and a quarter. We see here how the original Enochian calendar could be used to convert easily between the standard year of 365 days and the original calendar of only 360. The 360-day calendar divides into four seasons of 90 days each, which in turn each divide into three months of 30 days each, for a total of 12 months and 360 days. At the end of each season, a holiday is added, bringing the sum to the Enochian 364. Then, to bring the sum up to our own modern level of understanding, we add an annual holiday, 365. However, it was not originally the intention of the author of the Book of Enoch's description of the calendar to see it split apart like that. Instead, the author proposed a model split apart into three seasonal sections of 91 days each. Instead of splitting the year into four seasonal parts as we have now with spring, summer, autumn, and winter, the Enochian system describes a world defined by only three main seasons for their entire year. It was only later that this system was divided up into four parts as we have now. It is possible it was divided into four because of the 25 angels called Anunnaki, meaning watchers, in the book of Enoch, who fell and became the accursed Nephilim of Genesis, or Gregory of later Enochian. These 25 fallen watchers, less by one, Sabaoth, who it was said repented, were described in vivid detail in the Book of Enoch. Twenty-four fallen watchers can be placed around the calendar as two weeks of fifteen days each per each month of thirty days per each season of ninety days per each year of three hundred and sixty of three hundred and sixty-four or of 365. In the original version, the calendar was divided into three parts of 91 days each. The original number of Anunnaki watchers was given as seven who watch, corresponding to the seven sisters of the Pleiades constellation, whose names were Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Michael, Sarachiel, Gabriel, and Remiel. There were also seven angels, according to the Book of Enoch, who bred with the wives of men, the so-called Nephilim. There were also seven alchemical mountains that covered the area between where Enoch lived and the gateway to Eden, the entrance to paradise. There were, in addition, a total of 21 fallen angels listed in the Book of Enoch. Because the angels described in the Book of Enoch 
are all arranged in groups divisible by 7. And because the value of 7 is the sum of 3 plus 4, we may begin to see how the four-season calendar can be translated into the three-season calendar using the seven angels from the Book of Enoch as a guide. However, to best understand the meaning of the Enochian calendar, let us study the three main systems of calendars that arose immediately after the mythological global flood. First among these to arise in most detail was the Vedic calendar, as shown here around the larger outer ring for comparison with the common 12-month annular zodiac around the smaller interior ring. The Vedic calendar does not measure the Babylonian zodiac as it would read in the usual direction of months in a year. It reads them in the direction opposite this according to their use as a measure for the solar aeons of polar precession. The Vedic calendar is divided up into eight essential parts, split in half between them by a vertical axis, defining the left side of the circle as ascending and the right side as descending. The names of the eras or epochs are the same on both opposite sides of this vertical axis and are reflected symmetrically across from one another by it. These are, clockwise from the top, the Sattva Yuga, the Treta Yuga, the Dwarpa Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. The term Yuga relates not only to an extremely long duration of time, as demarcated on the Vedic calendar, but relates to five of the six sides of a dice. Supposedly, a dice is thrown by Krishna in a game played in his dream. There are five sides on the dice he can roll that will continue his dream, but if he rolls the sixth side of the dice, he will wake up. These five sides of the dice in Krishna's dream, which is the perpetual recreation of our own cosmos, are the five yugas, the golden sattva, the bronze treta, the copper dwarpa, and the most unlucky roll, the kali yuga, signifying an epoch of great destruction. It is said that if Krishna rolls the sixth side of the dice in his dream, then his dream will end and he will awaken, and our cosmos will cease to exist. It is this ceasing to exist in a single instant, and then flashing back into an entirely new reality in the next moment to follow, that causes the symmetrical mirroring effect along the vertical axis. The Sattva Yuga, or Golden Age, lasts the longest, beginning on a western clock at about 9.30, and continuing around clockwise until about 2.30. On the calendar, this era lasts from 16,302 to 3,602 B.C., a total of 12,700 years. It experiences a period of ascent first, followed by a period of descent. Its peak ascent occurred in 11,502 B.C. This peak ascent's pivotal nadir point is the middle of the Kali Yuga. Following the Satya Yuga, during a descending epoch, and following the Dvarpa epoch, during the era of ascent is the Treta Yuga, meaning the bronze roll. The third roll is seen as less lucky than the first roll, the roll of gold, but as more lucky than the second roll, the roll of copper, the Dvapara. The Kali Yuga, or worst roll, is seen as the most unlucky of them all and closest to being the sixth roll of the dice that would blink us all out of existence forever. The sixth-sided roll is signified by a date on this calendar system that corresponds to the year 
498 AD. The Vedic calendar is very old, very basic, and on the surface seems acceptable enough. However, remember that the calibration of the Vedic calendar relevant to the placement of the Babylonian zodiac of the usual aeons is not precise, nor necessarily accurate. Thus, though the calendrical system works as such, its dates relative to those on a modern calendar cannot be exactly accurately fixed. Thus, most importantly, the Vedic calendar is flexible. Its spans of duration can be moved around arbitrarily, but the basic number of them and their relationships to one another is never changing. There are as many as eight possible yugas that can be mapped onto the Vedic calendar, and these can be counted by as few as four kinds. These golden, bronze, copper, and silver ages were known to the earliest sages of China contemporary to the later Vedic era in India. By recombining the broken and unbroken Tao lines, symbolizing the basic yes or no options, of the Chinese Zen Yin Yang concept, three times each, one arrives at the eight Chinese I Ching trigrams. These are seen here, emanating inward toward the Yin Yang logo at the center from their names in the surrounding octagon. Red clockwise around from the upper right corner, they proceed Kun, Earth, Tui, Lake, Chayan, Heaven, Khan, Water, Ken, Mountain, Chen, Thunder, Shun, Wind, and Li, Fire. The attributions of the trigrams to elements, Mountain equals Earth, Wind equals Heaven, lake equals water, thunder equals fire, gives us a visual cue for describing them, but in reality all we are seeing here is a collection of 8 times 3 equals 24 Tao lines. These Tao lines are repeated as letters in many alphabets, the 24 Elder Futhark runes being the most similar, and derived in essentially the same way. However, these 24 Tao lines, comprising eight trigrams, symbolizing the doubling of four elements, are only the simplest form of the I Ching, which is a system devised for calendrical interpretation of the elements, and which is used now for divination. When the two states of Yin or Yang Tao lines are multiplied by three, they form two regular configurations, heaven and earth, which remain unchanging throughout, and six other irregular configurations called the trigrams of three dualistic Tao lines each. These are the eight trigrams of I Ching. If you take these eight trigrams and double each with itself, such that there is one trigram above and the other trigram below, you will have constructed the eight double hexagrams of I Ching. The eight hexagram doubles of these original eight prime trigrams represent the eight variations of fixed or relatively unchanging traits between the total set of eight possible trigrams and the total set of 64 possible hexagrams. Thus, two in eight are fixed, and so are eight in 64. The 64 hexagrams, formed by squaring the 8 trigrams, combining each per row with all the others per file, as above, so below, can, themselves, be arranged in a virtually infinite number of different ways. They are shown here in what is known as the King Wen sequence, named for the man who found it. The King Wen can yield a particular pattern of internal correspondence by comparing the first order of difference 
from one hexagram to the next in sequence. By plotting the changes in first order of difference between each hexagram, a graph can be arranged. This graph is what Terence and Dennis McKenna, who discovered it, named Time Wave Zero because it seemed to them to be counting down. To describe this interpretation, the McKenna brothers coined the term decreasing novelty. As the King Wen sequence progresses, the amount of novelty of the first order of difference decreases toward none. The 64 hexagrams are, as I mentioned, used today for divination for the very reason that, as the McKenna brothers discovered, as all possible combinations begin to be exhausted, as all recombinations have been tried, and as the remaining sum of untested models nears zero, and as the project approaches completion, the rate at which metastasis occurs accelerates asymptotically. Whether the King-Wen sequence can be empirically tested and determined if it is the top of such a figurative hyperbolic curve as the last possible recombination of all possible combinations depends on which combination one would use to start such a long sequence. The most important aspect of this line of reasoning is often overlooked by those studying it. The I Ching serves as a calendar because the 64 possible hexagrams are comprised of a total of 384 Tao lines, and there are exactly 384 nights in a 13-month lunar cycle. The lunar calendar records the real number of full moons per solar year and differs from the fixed number of days in the standard solar orbit-based calendar. While in China, the sages were arranging the apparently limitless recombinations of the 64 I Ching hexagrams. They were in Vedic India, writing in a language called Sanskrit. Sanskrit is an oriental phonetic alphabet and evolved from Proto-Ganges script in much the same way and at around the same time as Egyptian hieroglyphics appear to have evolved from Ugaritic Linear A. However, unlike the seemingly limitless vocabulary of languages based on ideographic letters such as Ancient Egyptian or Modern Chinese, Sanskrit has a fixed number of possible letters based on a limited range of audible sounds produced in a combination of pronunciations. The Sanskrit alphabet has 50 letters. Sanskrit is not directly relevant to the number of King Wen sequence I Ching hexagrams on the surface, since the number of the first order of difference between them would be 64 minus 50 equals 14, which is only twice 7, the number symbolizing the planets and chakras. However, if the eight double hexagrams are taken as literally meant to be expressed twice, and the sum of 64 hexagrams is increased from 64 to 72, then the number of Sanskrit letters being 50, which is in turn 22 less than 72, becomes somewhat more relevant. At the same time the most ancient Vedic myths and fables were being recorded in Sanskrit in India, across the Hindu Kush mountain range southwest of the Himalayas, in the fertile crescent region of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers valley, nowadays the arid deserts called Iraq, their alphabet was cuneiform, a partially phonetic, partially ideographic dialect of a variant total number of letters. But the 50 Sanskrit letters of the Indus River Valley were venerated, instead, as the 50 names of Marduk in the Babylonian pre-Hebrew Genesis in Numa Elish. These 50 names of Marduk were, originally, the names of 50 Anunnaki, watchers, who, according to the older Sumerian myths, were aliens from another planet. Regardless of the origins of the Anunnaki of Sumeria, the 50 names in the Enuma Elish are a comparable concept from ancient Mesopotamia 
to the 50 Sanskrit letters. The Sumerian Anunnaki may have been as few as 50 or any number more, however Marduk was only one. The original monotheist faith was not the solar worship instituted by Amenhotep IV when he built Karnak and was renamed Akhenaten. It was and remains to this day the worship of Marduk, the monotheist patron deity of Babylon. Marduk is the god whom the Old Testament is based on. Marduk is the devil, Satan, worshipped as Moloch at Bohemian Grove. Marduk is Krishna appearing to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra in his many-armed form, saying, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Marduk is Apuk of the Mayan Popol Vuh and related codices. Marduk was the archetypal great burner in his role in Babylonian myth as the bringer of the hot winds that killed off all the gods after the flood, just after the erection of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues at the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham fled the lands of Ur and entered the lands of Egypt. The significance of Marduk's fifty names is, once again, related to the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. When you combine the 50 letters of Sanskrit in the form of the 50 names of Marduk with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the result is the 72-letter Shemhamphorash. Here we see the arrangement of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet called the 231 Gates of Benah. Each of the 231 gates is symbolized here by a line connecting one letter to another. Each letter is connected to all 22 others by a single line or gate, and thus there are 231 lines or gates connecting all 22 letters when they are arranged in a circle as such. In this arrangement, as in the next, we begin at the position of the uppermost left with Aleph, and proceed counterclockwise toward Beth, and then proceed around counterclockwise until we read Tao on the uppermost right. In this arrangement of the 231 gates diagram for the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, we do not see them as Hebrew letters at all, but rather as their shorthand notation symbols representing the three alchemical elements, the seven Olympic planets, and the twelve Babylonian zodiac signs. We begin with Aleph equals air, and proceed around counterclockwise to Beth equals moon, and so forth until we come to Tao equals Jupiter. The attribution of what traits to which letters, and vice versa, has been a matter of long debate among literary Kabbalists, and appears to remain more or less arbitrary. The overall number is important, wherein there are 22 Hebrew letters only because there are 22 attributes symbolized by the three elements, seven planets, and twelve zodiac signs, just as there are twelve consonants and seven vowels in Greek for the same reason. All arrangements of these symbols on such a circle obeying the format of the 231 gates of Benah will eventually repeat patterns that can also occur as star charts in astrology. The Dandara Zodiac of the Osiris Hathor Temple of Ancient Egypt is the oldest known structure depicting the constellations of the northern night sky. With almost no alterations, this same chart is used to this day in astrology. We see Aries in the upper right, proceeding counterclockwise around to Taurus in the upper left, and so forth. There are three figures in the middle that do not appear to reflect the traditional characteristics of the tropical zodiac's originally Babylonian signs. These symbolize the Big Dipper as an ox leg, Draco as Sobek, and Vega as a small fox. Also around the outer edge, outside of the circle formed from the signs of the tropical zodiac, are 36 deacons, 
each symbolizing one week of ten days in a 360-day solar calendar with five holidays used as the Egyptian civic calendar during the Old and Middle Kingdoms. The 36 deacons of the Egyptian solar civic calendar represent an idea almost identical to the 50 names of Marduk. They are thought to be at once anthropic deities and measures of time on a calendar. It is for this very good reason we say the earliest authentically Hebrew Hakabalists were schooled on metaphysics in Egypt. All of Egyptian religion in the form of worship as deified, the ideograms of their liturgical literature, was entirely based on study of the anthropomorphic expression as combined homozoomorphs of complex, advanced levels of metaphysical thought. To analyze the role in their cosmology of each Egyptian god would take much longer than I have time for here. Suffice it to say that these 36 Egyptian deacons are the key to fully unlocking the meaning of the 72-letter Shimham Farash as one-fifth, called a jubilee, of a 360-day calendar model. The next step in the history of the 360-day calendar model came when the Habaru-speaking Hyksos, shepherd kings of Lower Egypt, followed Akhenaten and his brother Tutmosis, calling themselves Moses and Aaron, into exile out of Egypt and into the wastelands of the Sinai Peninsula in an event the Bible records as the Exodus. One particular aspect of great interest to literary Kabbalists from the book of Exodus describing these events was the description of Moses calling upon God to part the Red Sea. The magical incantation deriving from this account forms 72 angel names of three letters length each, when the three sentences of seventy-two letters each are read as rows along columns rather than as columns along rows. The total sum of all the letters in this passage combined forms the Shimham Farash of 216 letters. 216 is three-fifths of 360. Likewise, 72 times 2 equals 144, which is a Fibonacci number, or a number that occurs in the set of additive sums, where each integer is the sum of the digits of the two prior integers to it on the list. Beginning with 1 plus 1 equals 2, where 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, and so forth, on up to the twelfth iteration of 89 plus 55 equals 144. When plotted onto a Cartesian coordinate graphing chart, these Fibonacci numbers will naturally occur on points forming a golden ratio spiral. Here we see the second group of 72 derived from the 216-letter Exodus verse Shimham Farash, known as the Goetic Shimham Farash, referring to a practice of black magic forbidden by monotheism. Just as the Shimham Farash itself was considered angelic, so was its counterpart, the Goetic Shimham Farash, considered demonic. The demonic Gosha version of the Shimham Farash provides sigils, or mason's marks, for each of the 72 demons it signifies. These were believed to have been the original builders' insignias emblazoned on the bricks each laid while they were enlisted by King Solomon to help build the first temple to God. The Goetic sigils were either used later or invented and backdated from during the Middle Dark Ages, toward the end of the Inquisition and the dawning of the Age of Enlightenment. They were used in ritual evocation or a magical ceremony involving the physical activity of the magician in order to summon a tangible manifestation of one of the Goetic demons. 
This was accomplished by a magus standing inside a so-called magic circle and conjuring or gesturing with a wand to accentuate and stir up chaos energy toward the accomplishment of their will. According to the Middle Dark Age grimoires, some of which were translated by S. L. McGregor Mathers, there were two keys to unlocking the mystery of the Shamham Farash of 216 letters from the Exodus verse. One was the greater key of King Solomon, a system based on assigning 36 talismans among the seven planets, and the other, the lesser key, the Goetia of King Solomon, assigning 72 names of demons to the work on the Temple of Solomon. The difference between the lesser and greater keys of Solomon the King is accentuated and expanded upon by comparing the mythology regarding demons being the builders of Solomon's Temple to the craft of free and accepted speculative masonry. Blue Lodge Freemasonry's primary myth is of the building of Solomon's Temple. It's designed by Hiram Mabiff, a Tyrian, and his betrayal and murder by three construction workers. Does this mean that these three traitorous killers were actually from among the 72 names of demons in the Goetia? Here we see the secret seal of Solomon from the Goetia or Lesser Key. The anagram around the edge of the seal is an acronym. The notericon of this phrase is understanding of one of the Freemasonic lost words. The anagram around the outside of the secret seal of Solomon depicts sigils or automatic writing signatures in an alienated cursive script-like form. However, to one familiar with this topic from the Masonic point of view, who would know where to look for a comparison between traits in the Dark Age grimoires about the Goetia and use of demons as workers on Solomon's Temple on the one hand, and on the other hand the secret society which was formed around the same time as the Dark Age grimoires were forged, e.g. F and A.M., the similarity to the Royal Arch Capstone, the stone the builders rejected, is obvious. So this is often the first place of conjunction many Masons come into the study of all this material through, rather like fitting an elephant through a pinhole. In this 17th century wood carving, we see a scene depicting Solomon using a magic ring of power to control a host of demons, including among who is, we are told, Baalzebul, the Lord of the Flies, whose title is Baal, and whose name is Zebub. Baal Zebub was a predecessor to the demon Belial, written of by the Essenes of Qumran in the War Scroll as the father of all lies, and who was called, by the era of the Dark Age grimoire's composition, Belier. Likewise, Lucifer to the early Christians had become Lucifugrovacale by the time of the grimoires. Solomon was, even according to the biblical accounts, not a strict adherent of monotheism. It may be possible he believed that by hiring a force of 72 work overseers for a larger number of crews, he was honoring the monotheist god of Moses, emulating the 72 Shimham Farash in his Goetia. However, to the stricter monotheist priest class of Solomon's era, Solomon's methods were heretical and so they accused him of worshipping demons, specifically the fallen angels from the era of the Book of Enoch, which had, by the era of Solomon, become known as demons. Later still, as recently as the 20th century AD, there has been a strong resurgence of occult interest in this entire line of reasoning that has occurred due, largely, to the Golden Dawn members' releasing of their translations or interpretations of the Dark Ages grimoires. In this diagram from S. L. McGregor Mathers and Aleister Crowley's 20th century of the Gothia, we see the triangle of conjuring into which the gesturing Magus would seek to visualize his desired demon into being, and the magic circle of the magician's craft inside which the Magus stood to protect themselves from any adverse effects of their sorcery 
occurring in their surrounding environment. The angelic names of the Exodus verse Shemhamfarash appear on the coiled serpent symbolizing the Magus' magic circle. Such is the current condition in which we find the most prevalent knowledge about the Shemhamfarash, name of God, based on the 360 solas per annum calendar of prehistoric mankind. In this colorized version of the same diagram, we see even more clearly that the blue hexagrams inside the circle are meant to keep the energy from outside out, and that the red pentagrams outside the circle are meant to keep the energy from the inside in. The hexagram is the symbol of the macrocosm, and the pentagram of the microcosm. Thus, because this ritual, and all related forms of conjuring, constitutes the practice of black magic, and thus is accredited first to the grimoires of King Solomon, and because of the injunction against the practice of any form of ritual black magic, all forms of such evocation are prescribed by the monotheist deity from the book of Leviticus onward, and remain so today. However, deeply buried beneath this moral morass of reasons not to practice magic is the truth about this system originally representing a prehistoric calendar. The trick to reading the Goetic Shemhamfarash as a calendar is to read it as upon the back of the coiled serpent. Thus, this form of the calendar model coils, or rather, spirals. The trick is to read it like one would read the Rose Cross Layman, which has three layers of petals, the outermost of twelve, the middle of seven, and the innermost of three. When one constructs a sigil pattern by using the Rose Cross Layman as a template, one takes each letter of the name and finds its location among the twenty-two Hebrew letters marking the petals of the Rose Cross Layman, then connects the dots in sequence. The resulting vector pathway appears flat, but could also be seen as occupying depth in a third dimension by considering the Rose Cross Layman itself as if it were, like a real rose, comprised of three layers of petals, each layer of different depth. The entire point of creating sigils, however, is to summon universal energy to assume strength for your own will over natural elemental forces by forging their seal to summon it. Because the thorns of this rose are poisonously fatal, sigil magic is prescribed in Leviticus. However, the Golden Dawn restarted the open practice of it by distributing and explaining the Rose Cross Layman. Just as the Rose Cross Layman symbolizes the rotation of the three top petals, the three alchemical elements, the seven middle petals, the seven planets, the twelve lowest petals, the twelve zodiac signs, of multiple levels, all operating independently of one another. So too does the same method apply to deciphering this model, which has long baffled Mesoamerican anthropologists in its normal flat form, the Aztec calendar stone. The Aztec stone is meant to imply the depth of a round conical tower seen from above. In the middle is the large face of Tezcatlipoca, the fifth sun. Surrounding him are the smaller faces of the four other world suns or Aztec eons. One step lower down from this level we find the ring of twenty day names, Aztec months. One step below these are eight dividing arrows, and beyond them in the outer ring are twelve glyphs hidden as scales on twin snakes with human faces wrapped around upward from the bottom on either side, with the thirteenth symbol being shared by both, to total the thirteen day names of Aztec weeks. The method of reading the Aztec calendar stone is to think of it as looking down on an upright tower. The myth regarding the Tower of Babel is that it was built by mankind because they wanted to make a name for themselves and to become like unto the god of contemporary monotheism, i.e. Marduk. This only aroused their god's displeasure, 
and the result of their attempt to please him by emulation of him was the confusion of the tongues, whereby all the various different regionally evolved languages spoken today were first given to mankind, and we were all made to speak in them. This is significant because it puts the date of the first alphabets around the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah following the global flood, prior to Abraham's leaving Ur and entering Egypt. This is contemporary, historically speaking, to the era of the end of the Sumero-Akkadian Golden Age and the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. Thus, the Tower of Babel has come to symbolize God's wrath at mankind's hubris. To Ganesh, the avatar of Brahma, the creator. To Vishnu, the preserver, who was Buddha, who was Krishna, who will be Maitreya. To Shiva, the destroyer, and her manifestation as the Yuga of Kali. To the religion of the Hebrews, the Reform, Orthodox, and Hasidic. To the religion of all Christendom. Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, to the religion of Islam, the Sevener Ishmaeli, the Twelver Shiites, and the Sunni, let the tower symbolize a warning of fate's dissatisfaction with greed, and remember the symbol of the New World Order is the eye in the triangle printed on money.